I have a friend who wrote this a couple years ago. There is a reason I am obsessed with grace. There is a reason that I've spoken and written about grace more than any other thing. And here it is. Because everything else in this bankrupt world feels like it's about worthiness. It's about proving ourselves and knowing who we are better than. Everything else is about making judgments, being the best, and optimization. Everything that is not rooted in grace that I have been offered in life feels like it's all about just trying harder. But I've tried trying harder, and it doesn't make me free. It just makes me tired. The message, as you hear week in and week out at the sanctuary, the message of Christianity is not a message about better behavior. It's not what it is. It's not a message about self-improvement or moral renovation. It's not a message about living for God or doing good things. It's a message of grace. It's a message of God loving us and accepting us because he is good, not because we are good. Grace is the central theme of Christianity. In fact, it's what makes Christianity different than any other approach to life, different than any other religion, different than any other philosophy. In every other religion or approach to life, performance precedes acceptance. If you want love, you have to be deserving of it. We get that message everywhere we go. Everywhere we go, that's the message that we get, that acceptance or performance precedes acceptance, that if we want love and if we want approval, then we have to work for it. We have to be deserving of it. Um, but in Christianity, acceptance and love comes first. Remember a couple of weeks ago, we looked at the story of Noah um, and in that story, we saw that we are loved and favored, and then we walk with God, not the other way around. It's very, very important to get that order right. Christianity is unique in that sense. It announces that we are loved, we are accepted, we are favored first, and then, and only then, do we walk with God? It's not that we walk with God and prove ourselves worthy of his love. And if we pass all of the tests that he puts out before us, then and only then will he love us and accept us. That's the way the world works. That's the way our relationships oftentimes work, but that's not the way God works, thankfully. Um, Rich Mullins, who was a musician and died a number of years ago in, in a car accident, wrote this. I've attended church regularly since I was less than a week old. I've listened to sermons about virtue and sermons against vice. I've heard sermons about money, time management, marriage, and goal setting. I've listened to thousands of sermons, but I could count on one hand the number of sermons I've heard strictly about Jesus. I find that same testimony to be true in a lot of places from a lot of people, people who write to us or people who talk to us and tell us about their own experience growing up in a Christian community or growing up going to Christian schools or in a lot of churches. Sermon after sermon, book after book, they say, is a practical lesson on how to live a better life, how to have healthier relationships, how to stop bad habits, how to love God more. And while some of that advice may be helpful and it may be true, it's not the fundamental backbone of Christianity the goal of Christianity is not to give you good advice or to lay out for you some good techniques on how to live a better life. The goal of Christianity is to deliver good news. It's simply to give you Jesus, to announce his forgiveness, to announce his righteousness for you, to announce his forever friendship to you, it's not first and foremost about our personal transformation. It's first and foremost about Jesus's substitution, his work 
for us outside of us that gives us the hope and the security and the significance that we long for. See, the message of Christianity is not we should copy every good move Jesus made. We, we, we can't anyway, okay, as hard as you may try. We talked about this a little bit last week. If Jesus is nothing more than just a good example, we're in trouble because he was better than all of us and none of us, even though we want to aspire to be like that, we will never be like that. We can't be, which is why he had to come and be for us what we could never be for ourselves. So Christianity, the message of Christianity is not copy every good move Jesus made. Rather, it is Jesus died for every bad move we make. That's Christianity. That's the fundamental message of the gospel. You could say it this way. The focus of religion is on the amount of love I have for God, the focus of Christianity is on the amount of love God has for me. That's, that's the difference. Um, and we see that contrast explicitly here when we look at the story of Peter. Peter's confidence was misplaced. He was certain, confident that his love for God, his devotion to God would ultimately win the day. His confidence was in his love for Jesus. Peter, if you know anything about Peter, uh, he was always much quicker to speak than he was to listen. Uh, He acted oftentimes without thinking. Um, He never had a problem voicing his devotion to Jesus, ever. Uh, He loved Jesus and wasn't shy about making that known. He was very proud of his piety, So at the Last Supper, when Jesus was washing his disciples' feet and he got to Peter, Peter said, no way. There's no way I'm going to let you wash my feet. Because of who you are, I should be washing your feet. And Jesus responds and says, "Uh, Peter, if I don't wash your feet, then you can have no part of me. And he just says very piously in front of everybody, well, if that's the case, then wash my whole body. I'm that devoted to you. I'll do whatever you tell me to do, you know. Um, He never had a problem voicing his devotion to Jesus. He loved Jesus, and he wasn't shy about making that known. He wanted people to know how much he loved Jesus. He was confident in his commitment to Jesus. He was proud of his love for Jesus. He was convinced that his devotion to Jesus was solid and that it would carry the day, that it would sustain him. Well, Jesus wants to teach him and us something something that will ultimately set him and us free. Verse 30 um, of Matthew 26, verse 30 begins by saying, when they had sung a hymn. It's interesting that that part of the passage is in there. Why does Matthew mention at the beginning of this episode that they sang a hymn? I think it's beautiful and poignant uh, why Matthew included that. Most Bible scholars are certain that the hymn they sang was Psalm 36. I mean, Psalm 136. And Psalm 136 is 26 verses long. And 26 times, that means in every verse of Psalm 136, it says, His, namely God's, steadfast love endures forever. Over and over and over again, 26 times. They sang this hymn, and 26 times in that psalm, it says, his steadfast love endures forever. Before he goes to the cross, why is Jesus doing this? Because before he goes to the cross, Jesus wants to drive home to all his disciples, that it's his that it's his love for them, not their love for him, which endures forever. He wants to drive that home. He wants to make that clear. In verse 31, uh, he says, um, tonight, all of you will desert me. Okay, so they sing this hymn, his love endures forever. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. They sing this hymn. And then immediately after that, uh, Jesus says, tonight, all of you will desert me. And of course, you know, Peter's immediate response, in light of the fact that they just sang this hymn about the steadfastness, the solidity of God's love for them, 
And then Jesus says, tonight, this is going to be proven because you all are going to desert me. And Peter's response to that, this is why I say he oftentimes talks without listening or he acts without thinking because he immediately says, I will never desert you. They may. (laughs) I mean, I've been around these guys. I've watched their flimsiness when it comes to their commitment to you, but not me. I am steadfast. I am firm. I am a friend that will go with you to the death. He's confident in his love for God. Um, he's like, no way. They, they, they may fall away, but I will never fall away. Never. Um, and then when Jesus tells Peter that before the night is over, he will deny him three times, Peter responds and says, not me. No, there's no way. There's no way that will happen. No way. Even if I have to die with you, I will. I will go to my death with you, and I will go to my death for you. His confidence is so rooted in his own devotion to God, in his own love for God. That's where his confidence is placed. Sounds like a lot of us. We think our devotion to God is solid. We think our love for God is admirable, that it will keep us safe, that it will sustain us, that it will keep us on the right track. In fact, we're, we're pushed by songs and sermons to believe that's true about us. Well, the flip side of that is that there's no room for faltering. <laughs> we have to be and remain strong if everything is going to turn out okay. So if our confidence is placed in our faithfulness to God, our devotion to God, our love for God, then it doesn't leave any room for failure, It doesn't leave any room for faltering. It doesn't leave any room whatsoever to be weak. We have to remain strong. Um, I mean, I've heard it my whole life, sermons and songs that push our love for God, our work for God, our performance for God, our devotion to God. I mean, songs and sermons, I can't tell you how many sermons I've heard over the years and Sunday school lessons over the years that seem to make the entire point of Christianity our steadfast love for God. And pushing us to that end, love God more, serve God more, sacrifice for God more, do more for God, try harder for God. It ends up being all about us. And in that sense, we are oftentimes encouraged to do the one thing we shouldn't do, which is to place our confidence in our love for God. And Jesus wants to correct that for Peter And Jesus oftentimes corrects that for us as well. Um, But what happens with Peter often happens with us too. I mean, Peter's love fails miserably, miserably. I mean, it's, it's hard to believe that less than 24 hours before Peter denies him, Jesus says, you're going to deny me three times. And it's like he forgets or something. It's probably only 12 hours later, to be honest, that he's asked three times if he knows Jesus. And three times he says, I don't know him. I've never met him. He even calls down a curse on himself if he's lying, which he knows he is. He knows he's lying. He's, he's afraid. He's scared. His love for God buckled under pressure. His love for Jesus uh, just sort of went out the back door. Um, Just like Jesus said, Peter denies him three times. And first, he denies that he was with Jesus. His, His denials intensify. Okay, so first he denies that he was with Jesus. Then he denies that he knows Jesus. Then he curses and swears that he does not know Jesus. Luke uh, 22, 61 adds in this same episode, it tells this same episode, and it adds, and the Lord turned and looked at Peter. When the rooster crowed three times, a third time, um, and it just says, and the Lord turned and looked at Peter. There's this beautiful, haunting scene uh, in the movie Jesus. It came out in the early 80s, maybe late 70s, early 80s. I think Campus Crusade for Christ put it out. 
And uh, one Sunday afternoon, my mom and dad took all of us, all of us kids, all of us seven kids. Well, if it was in the late 70s, then it would only been six kids because my little brother wasn't born yet. But uh, took our entire family to see it in the theater. And this scene where Peter denies him three times and then it shows Jesus. There's a scene in the movie where it shows Jesus just sort of waiting to be tried, sitting by a fire. Um, having already been beat up uh, by the Roman guards. And as soon as the rooster crows, Jesus just turns and looks at Peter with these eyes, not eyes of disappointment, just almost eyes of compassion. Like, I told you, this isn't about you and your love for me. Your love for me can't even sustain you for 12 hours can't even sustain you for 12 hours. I mean, 12 hours ago, I was telling you in the face of your uh, sort of, in the face of your bold pronouncement that you would never deny me, that you would never, ever desert me. And I told you you would. 12 hours later, you do. Um, And the look in that scene, like I said, was not a look of disappointment, like, oh my gosh, you idiot. Uh, It was just, it was a look of compassion. Like, I I want you to be set free from this false notion that your love for me will carry the day. I want you to be free from that, Peter. And oftentimes, the way God sets us free is by allowing us to fail, allowing us to sort of come to the end of ourselves and to maybe have our confidence in our own abilities shattered. And at first, it seems like that's a mean thing for God to do. I mean, why would God allow me to fail? Why would God not protect me from failure? Um, And oftentimes, it's because we have to realize that we're not all that. We're not as strong as we might think we are, especially when it comes to God. We're not as strong as we think we are. We're not as devoted as we think we are. We're not as faithful as we think we are. We're not as good as we think we are. Um, Because God wants us to shift our focus away from ourselves and onto him. That's where freedom is found. And as long as we're believing our own press and thinking that we can do it, that we can make it, that when push comes to shove, we will stand for God, as long as we believe that about ourselves, then we will never put our confidence where our confidence ought to be, which is in God's love for us, God's faithfulness to us, God's devotion to us. Um, I mean, that, that, that scene, it was just uh, haunting, as I said, in that movie. And, and the look on Peter's face, he, when Jesus looks across the courtyard at him, the look on Peter's face is one of, like, complete shame. And he runs away and finds his way to an alley and just breaks down and weeps. Like, he knows. He knows. I failed. His love did not carry the day. His love melted as soon as the heat got turned up. His love faded in the face of a threat to his well-being, like ours does so often. So whose love endures forever? Not Peter's, not ours. Fast forward to John chapter 21 the passage that I read a few minutes ago. The disciples come back. This is after Jesus is resurrected. He's died, and he's come back to life. Um, And the disciples come back from fishing early one morning, and the resurrected Jesus is waiting for them on the beach cooking breakfast. And they're amazed um, to see him, and they're delighted to see him. Um, And uh, Peter sits down, and Jesus three times asks him, Peter, do you love me? Um, Peter was probably just jonesing for the opportunity to say, I'm sorry, and to say, yes, I love you. Um, And Jesus says, then feed my sheep. And then he asks him again, Peter, do you love me? And Peter's like, "You, you know I love you. And you know I'm sorry for denying you. And then a third time Jesus asks, Peter, do you love me? And Peter's like, this is, the Bible says Peter was hurt by this. He's like, you know all things. 
you know that I love you. I mean, what a, what a grueling experience for Peter. I remember the first time I read that, it almost seemed like Jesus was rubbing Peter's failure in his face, putting salt in his wound. But Jesus is actually doing something amazing here. Beautiful, gracious for Peter. He does the same thing with us. Notice that Jesus recommissions Peter three times, just as Peter had denied Jesus three times. And what Jesus is doing in that moment is showing Peter and showing us that his forgiveness matches and ultimately overpowers our failures. Matches and overpowers our failures. He wants Peter to know you are forgiven for everything you've ever done and everything you'll ever do. That your sin and your failure is no match for my grace. That your sin and your failure is no match for my forgiveness. That you can never, ever out-sin or out-fail the coverage of my forgiveness. You're enveloped in mercy. You're enveloped in grace. It's my steadfast love for you, Peter, endures forever. My steadfast love for you endures forever. And in order for you, Peter, to place your confidence where it needed to be, namely my love for you, I had to show you that your love for me was not nearly as solid as you thought it was. It was much weaker than you thought it was. So you see, he's actually setting Peter free. He's actually giving Peter a low anthropology. He's helping Peter see himself for who he is so that he will see Jesus for who he is. Um, Isn't it uh, interesting? I mean, his his love, God's love for us is, is so great that he even fits our failures into his future for us. Uh, it's, It's not like God uses us in spite of our failures. God uses us because of our failures. I mean, it was Peter's failure that readied him to do the work that Jesus was commissioning him to do. It wasn't his goodness, his put-togetherness, his obedience, his faithfulness, his spiritual sturdiness. That's not what... He, he was all of those things before. Or he thought he was. I'm spiritually sturdy. I mean, he was useless when he thought he was bigger than he was. But he becomes useful to God when he now realizes he's much smaller and weaker than he thought he was. Much more useful. It's it's amazing to me that he, God, even fits our failures into his future for us. It's interesting that it was only after Peter failed, after that Jesus said, feed my sheep. After Peter's cataclysmic disappearing act, after he denies Jesus, after he fails to demonstrate sturdiness of love for Jesus, it was after all that stuff, after Peter falls flat on his face, um, that Jesus says, feed my sheep. One of my favorite movies of all time uh, is the Ten Commandments. I mean, it is an epic. The one with Charlton Heston comes on every Easter. An amazing movie. If I'm sure a lot of you have seen it. Uh, if you haven't seen it, you need to watch it. Um, but you know the story. It's the story of Moses, and uh, he's born a prince of Egypt. Well, he's not actually born a prince of Egypt. Uh, he's born to Hebrew slaves. Um, and in order to try and save his life, Uh, Moses' mother puts him in a basket and sends him down the Nile River. And uh, Pharaoh's relative, the king of Egypt's relative, finds the baby and raises him as her own. And so he grows up in all of the glories of Egypt as royalty. And as he gets older, he realizes that uh, that he's actually uh, Hebrew. Um, And when he gets wind that Pharaoh uh, is torturing the Hebrews and is treating them as poorly as he is, uh, Moses confronts him and basically Pharaoh kicks him out of Egypt. 
And in the movie The Ten Commandments, uh, Pharaoh, Ramses, um, who's played by Yul Brenner, amazing actor, by the way, um, but he basically sends him into the desert with one day's worth of, like a, like a two-week journey in the desert. Says, you're out. I'm, I'm casting you out. And sends him out into the desert uh, with one day's ration of food and water. And the way the narrator narrates that scene, you see Moses with his staff walking into the endless desert. Um, and at first he's standing strong and he's walking firm. You know, he's, he, he's fit and he's fed. But as the days go on, he gets weaker and weaker and weaker and his walk becomes slower and he eventually, his walk eventually becomes a crawl and then he ends up falling on his face. And the whole time you see this progression toward weakness happening, the narrator is describing the way God has to break a man down to nothing before he can be of any use. And we see that. And of course, the rest is history. Moses was used by God to usher all of his people out of slavery in Egypt and into the promised land. And so, um, and so there's, there's, there's a hard but liberating truth to that. When God is deconstructing you, when he's reminding you, okay, through life's circumstances that you're broken, that you're weak, uh, that you're not as good as you think you are. He's not doing that to be mean. He's doing that to set you free. He's doing that to set you free. He, he, he doesn't want you to think, I'm a good person and I've got a really good heart and I'm, I'm strong and, I'm, and I do good things for God. As long as you believe that nonsense, you're of no use. You're of no use to God. Uh, because as Paul says in Corinthians, it is through our weaknesses that God showcases his strength. It's not through our successes, our triumphs, that God showcases his strength. It's, it's through our weakness that God showcases his strength. Um, we have this mistaken notion that strength and success is what makes us effective, that failure disqualifies us from being useful to God. Well, not according to the Bible, from cover to cover, this is just one of many stories in the Bible that show that no one is more qualified to speak of the significance of sin and the grandeur of grace like the one who has failed miserably. No one. Um, I mean, recovery places have figured out that the best people to reach those who have bottomed out are those who have bottomed out themselves. And I think the church could learn a lot from recovery places in that regard. You know, we, we like our... We like our, our leaders and our pastors to be steadfast and sturdy, someone we can aspire to be like. And invariably, they let us down. They let us down. Um, and uh, and we're, we, we find ourselves frustrated and disappointed. You failed us. And the reason we come to that conclusion is because we have put this person up on a pedestal. Uh, and we want to believe that this person has it all together and they serve as a model example that we too may be able to get it all together if he can or if she can. Um, and there ends up becoming this massive disconnect between the pulpit and the pew. Because you would never, for instance, ever walk into an Alcoholics Anonymous meeting and find someone leading that meeting who did not struggle with alcohol. Never. I mean, it, 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 the recovery places have figured out that the best person to reach someone who is bottoming out is someone who has bottomed out themselves. That's so important. That principle is so important. And we see that so clearly here. I mean, who better for Jesus to send into the world to feed his sheep and talk about sort of the, you know, the devastation of sin and the grandeur of grace and the amazing steadfast nature of God's love than Peter, who experienced all of that stuff. He could speak from personal experience. I know that my love for God is not strong, but that's not where my hope is. And that's not where your hope should be. Our hope should be anchored in the fact that God loves us not that we love him. I mean, who better to speak of the love of a patient father than prodigals who ran away from home and ended up in a pigsty? I mean, you see this all over the place. 
to deny this is true is to deny the Bible and what God says about himself and what God says about us. Um, the Franciscan priest Richard Rohr wrote this, and I find it to be uh, really good and very true. He says, it's not that failure might happen. No, it will happen, and it will happen to you. Losing, failing, falling, sin, and the suffering that comes from those things is all a necessary and even good part of the human journey. In God's economy of grace, sin and failure become the base metal and raw material for redemption. Isn't that good? I mean, I, I was, you know, I was sort of taught growing up in the places that I was. Not my home, mom. You taught me well. You taught me right. But in all of the other places that you sent me, okay? Um, I mean, I was really taught that becoming a better person is what this whole thing is about. I mean, it was interesting to me, and I think it was Robert Capon who said something to this effect, that we work so hard to uh, create people that are so good that Jesus would have never had to die for them. <laughs> How ironic, how crazy, this last line by Roar, in God's economy of grace, sin and failure become the base metal and raw material for redemption. Now, this is what the, the objection to that comes in this question, and I've heard it for 15 years, okay? Um, so are you saying that we should fail on purpose so that we can experience more redemption? And of course, my answer is no. You'd be an idiot to fail on purpose because failure does make life harder and heavier and we experience horizontal consequences for stupid decisions. So if you don't wanna make your life harder and heavier, then don't pursue failure. But here's even worse news. You're already failing. You don't, I don't have to teach you to fail. I don't have to encourage you to fail. If you look closely enough at your own heart, you are failing. I mean, in, in God's economy before, before God, anything short of perfection is failure. Anything, anything and everything short of sinlessness is failure. So you don't have to pursue failure. Failure is pursuing you just fine, okay? Um, so no, of course the answer is not, should we go on sinning so that grace may abound? Like Paul addresses in Romans 6. And Paul says, of course not, you moron. That's not at all what I'm saying. In fact, if you ask that question, what it proves is that you don't get the gospel enough. It's not that you've understood grace so deeply that now you've concluded, I can go do whatever I want and it doesn't matter. No, a heart that's been gripped and grasped by the radicality of God's grace doesn't say things like that. I mean, it says things like, God, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. I want to follow you. And, and I, I want to love you better. It doesn't make you want to sin more. It makes you want to sin less. That's the effect that grace has on our hearts. It softens our hearts. Uh, it makes us more pliable. So Peter's story is proof that because it is God's love for us and not our love for him that makes us valuable... God's intention for those of us who fail is to use us. <laughs> Not to put you in a corner somewhere and tell you to shut up for the rest of your life. You had your chance. You blew it. You are now disqualified forever from ever talking about me to anyone, especially publicly. Um, that's not what he does. Um, rather, what he does is he, he picks us up and he washes us off and he opens our mouths so that we will speak more loudly than ever of his amazing grace. I mean, grace becomes increasingly amazing when it is set against our own failures, our own personal collapses. I mean, I, I've been talking about the grace of God and talking about the love of God and talking about the forever forgiveness of God for a long time. I've written books about it. I've preached about it. I've traveled and spoke about it. Uh, and I believed it. I believed it. Uh, but it wasn't until my life came crashing down and everybody sort of bailed. 
but God didn't, then I realized he's, he's not a liar. When he said, I will never leave you, and he said, I will never forsake you, he meant it. I gave God every reason in the world to just wash his hands of me, every reason in the world. I mean, he had given me so much, and I squandered it all. I mean, what an entitled, arrogant, punk kid. I mean, if, that, if, if my kid had acted the way I acted, I mean, I would have a hard time, a really hard time uh, with that child. And, uh, and God just, I'm sticking, I'm staying. My delight in you has never wavered. You are clothed and cloaked in a suit of my son's righteousness, and I can't turn away from you any more than I could turn away from him. You're mine forever. You're stuck with me, come hell or high water. His grace and his friendship to me was proven in the cracks of life, in the catastrophe of my own disaster. God's love and his friendship was proven to me. Oftentimes it takes a coming to the end of ourselves, a, a desperation. And it doesn't have to look anything like mine. It could be anything relationally, physically, emotionally. I mean, there are a lot of ways that God works to show us just how much we need him and how loyal he is to us. Lots of different ways. But until that happens, until we finally get to a place of desperation, Grace just won't seem that amazing to us. And we'll say things like, okay, we talk about this every week. Can we move on now? Can you please start telling me how to live my life? My life is out of control, and I need you, preacher, to tell me how to live my life so I can get my life back under control. That's not Christianity. It's not. That may be good advice. It may be good advice. It may not be good advice, depending on who's advising. But it may, you may get good advice that way. But that's not good news, and that's what we need. Good news. Um, I, I find it... Uh, fascinating that never once in all the gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, never once did Jesus look around the room for the most obedient person and then send that person out to tell others about him. <laughs> never. Never. He always sent stumblers and sinners. He sent Peters. He sent me. He sends you. I find that really comforting, super comforting. Because as I said, it is our failures and not our successes where God's grace shines the brightest through us into the lives of other people, through us. Um, we're going to take communion in a minute, but uh, I want to conclude with this. I said a few weeks ago, and I've said this on a handful of occasions, that if our understanding of Christianity does not have room for the fact that our greatest failure may be in front of us, then we need to scrap it. Okay, that's a, it's kind of scary to think about that, uh, that if our understanding of what the Christian life is does not have room, does not have space for the fact that our greatest failure may be ahead of us, then we should scrap it, okay? Because you'd think that after this humiliating experience that Peter had, after his humiliating experience, that he would have been cured forever from his tendency to fail God. But he wasn't. If you go to Galatians, the apostle Paul has to confront Peter. This is years later. Has to confront Peter because there's a divide in the community there. You have the, the Jews and the non-Jews. And Jesus, of course, said to all of his disciples that this was previously just kind of a Jewish thing, but now it's a universal thing. And my family includes people from every tribe, tongue, and nation, Jews and non-Jews, Jews and Gentiles alike. But some of the Jews at that time didn't like that. They didn't like God's inclusivity. They liked sort of having God to themselves and being able to claim that God is their God, but not their God. And so there was, there was infighting happening amongst Christians, professing Christians. And the Apostle Paul shows up uh, to the region of Galatia and notices that Peter is not associating with the non-Jews because he's getting pressure from the Jews to stick with them. And Paul loses it, confronts him, loses it. Like, what the hell's the matter with you, man? I mean, haven't you learned your lesson 
I mean, he's, here he is in a different way, denying Jesus again, again. Now, one of the reasons I actually find that episode comforting is because it's a reminder to me that God's love, the steadfastness of God's love, doesn't just meet us on the other side of failure. It meets us in our failure, at the point of failure. I mean, this, this is a beautiful picture of the fact that the Christian life is not, I'm getting better and better and stronger and stronger, and the mistakes I made yesterday, I've learned from them, and I'll never make them again. That's not what it's about. <laughs> because here, Peter, years later, is denying Jesus. I mean, after that, after that humiliating experience that we just looked at, humiliating experience, and it's years later now, and he's essentially doing the same thing. He's denying Jesus in a different way. He follows this same pattern. Isn't it good news that our lives are ultimately dependent on the sturdiness of God's love for us rather than the strength of our love for him? I mean, it is good news. Don't, don't put a whole lot of faith in yourself. <laughs> okay, I'm not saying that to be negative. I'm just being honest with you. I mean, I, I've never ended up in really good God-honoring places when I've put my faith in me, when I've trusted that my heart will lead me to the right place, okay? All of that nonsense that we hear, the essential goodness of humanity, I mean, Jenna and I joke about this all the time because she's a nanny, and I mean, she watches children that are from the age of, you know, really small. She started watching a baby when he was a couple months old, and we talk about this all the time. You know, we, you don't have to teach kids to, to be jerks, okay? I mean, you don't got to teach them. You don't got to teach them to lie. You don't got to teach them to do things they shouldn't. The moment you say to a child, uh, don't do that, it becomes the one thing they want to do. We don't have to teach this stuff. We don't have to teach them to sin. We don't have to teach them to be deceptive. We don't have to teach them to be sneaky. They come into this world like that. We all do. I was getting, uh, Stacy and I's lease, leases ran out on our cars this past month, and so we were in the position where we had to get new cars. Um, and so we turned our cars in and got new ones, and uh, I got mine last Monday, a week ago, tomorrow. And, uh, and I negotiated with the dealership to include tint on my windows as part of the deal. So we flew out of town on Tuesday. I got the car on Monday. I hate driving around in a car with no tint, by the way. I feel so naked and vulnerable. Um, <laughs> So, uh, so I said, listen, I'm going to drop my car off. Uh, this is Tuesday. We had to fly out of West Palm. So, uh, I'm going to drop my car off tomorrow. I told them this on Monday. I'm going to drop my car off tomorrow. Um, and please have your tint guy tint the windows as dark as he possibly can. Okay. He's like, well, we can't do illegal tint. And I was like, okay, we'll do, do as close to illegal as possible. Okay. I want it black. I don't want anybody seeing what I'm doing in my car, okay? Um, so <laughs> so uh, we fly to Philly. We fly back. She drops me off at the dealership to pick up my car. I couldn't wait to get it, you know, tinted windows. Um, and they say it's out back, so I go get my car. And they have this sticker across the sort of where you press the window button for the windows come down. And it says, do not open windows for three to five days. Okay. Now, I don't drive around with my windows down. I just said I, I like sort of <laughs> the confines of a, of a dark car. I, but, I mean, I saw that thing. <laughs> I promise you, I am not exaggerating. I was laughing in my car by myself. I have never wanted to roll my windows down more <laughs> than I did seeing the sticker telling me I couldn't roll my windows down. I mean, it was unbelievable. The entire ride home, I'm kind of like looking at it, I'm driving and I'm looking at it like, dang, man. That stuff doesn't leave us. We come into this world like that. We leave this world like that. I mean, we're just, we're not as good as we think we are. We're not as prone to goodness as we think we are. In fact, as the old hymn says, we're prone to wander. Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. Take my heart, 
Oh, take and seal it. Seal it for thy courts above. It's about his steadfast love for us. Um, Stacy posted on her social media yesterday uh, a quote by Barbara Brown Taylor. And I was, it was right at the time where I was trying to come up with a conclusion for the sermon and sort of a transition into communion. And she posted it. And I was like, I texted her, I was like, this is perfect. You gave me the ending to my sermon. Thank you. Um, I don't even pay her to be a research assistant for me, and she is. Um, but uh, Barbara Brown Taylor says this. It fits so perfectly with the sermon and the transition to communion. When Jesus holds up the cup and offers what is in it as the fluid of forgiveness, he's not talking to people with a short list of minor sins. He's talking to people who will turn him in, who will scatter to the four winds at the first sign of trouble, and who will swear they never knew him. He is talking to people who should have been his best friends on earth, who turn out not to have a loyal bone in their bodies, and he is forgiving them ahead of time. As surely as if he had said, I know who you are, I know you will not be innocent of the blood of this cup, but I will not let that come between us. Forgiveness is first. Acceptance comes first. Love comes first. 